become one of us and to die as us. We thank you for that. And I pray that you would use us like you did the early disciples to absolutely change the world. These people crawled into their holes and they were scared to death after you were executed, thinking that they were next. Yet when you showed up after the third day, that, that changed everything. And I pray that you would use us to spread this message that you died for every human being that ever lived. And I pray that you bless Brenda and Nathan and folks that need physical healing and, and wisdom for decisions. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, the book of Mark. Mark chapter number 16. <clears throat> Also, we need to pray that every grain of pollen will be blown to New York City or something like that. It just needs to get out of here. My word. Okay. Um, look at verse number one of Mark chapter 16. And when the Sabbath day was passed, Jewish days were calculated from sundown to sun up. Okay, not midnight to midnight like we do. So this changes things. And so the sun has gone down and the Sabbath is over now. So it is sunrise. What, what day on our calendar was the Sabbath? Saturday. Okay, so Saturday is over. All right, the Sabbath is passed. So now what day is it? It is Sunday around sunrise because it's over. <clears throat> Mary Magdalene and the mother of James and Mary the mother of James um, and Salome, this is the mother of James and John, by the way, brought sweet spices that, that, might, that they might come and anoint him. And very early, and this is around 5 a.m. in the morning, in the, in the morning of the first day of the week, they came under the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? That is an excellent logistic question because this stone weighed about 20 tons. This thing was huge. It covered uh, a cave, the opening of a cave. And there was a trench cut in front of this hole. And they rolled this round, like a great big old aspirin tablet. And they rolled this thing. And it took several, several, several men to do this. <clears throat> they rolled it in front of the hole, and then they sealed it. Isn't that a pretty good question for, let's see, we've got Mary, Mary, and Shalom. We've got three women. Who is going to do this for us? Uh, verse number four, when they looked, they saw the stone was rolled away. For it was very great. It was already moved. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted with the, the word means amazed. They were amazed at what they saw. And he said unto them, <clears throat> be not affrighted. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. So are they at the wrong tomb? Not at the wrong tomb, which is one of the explanations for the resurrection. Well, the women went to the wrong tomb. No, they did not. But go your way. Tell his disciples. Now, Interesting. If you are going to start a rumor of the magnitude of this. Now, everybody had heard that Jesus claimed himself was going to be raised from the dead, right? This was, this was known by everybody. So if you were going to start a rumor, would you use women to do it? Women did not have any legal authority at all. Did you know you ladies could not even give a testimony in a court of law? I mean, you were like zero when it came to any kind of influence. So if you're going to start a rumor, do not use women in the first century. You know, you would want to go to the president of the Senate or, you know, what I'm talking about, you'd want to go to somebody that's got some authority. So anyway, <clears throat> he said, go, uh, go tell Peter that he went before you into Galilee, there you shall see him as he said unto you. And they went and quickly, went out quickly and fled from the sepulchre, for they trembled and were amazed, neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. 
Now, when Jesus was risen very, uh, was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when, and they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, quickly embraced it and believed it wholeheartedly. No, they believed not. After he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country, and they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. Uh, so people didn't believe it before it happened. They didn't believe it after it happened. It's kind of a kind of a weird thing. Apologist, one of my favorite authors <clears throat> and author, uh, Josh McDowell, was not a Christian, and he had heard. You know, he was he was tired of hearing this about the resurrection. And so here's what he did. He decided to put his considerable investigative skills to work here, and he was going to dig into this thing of the resurrection. And here's what he said: "Quote." After more than 700 hours of studying this subject and thoroughly investigating its foundation, I have come to the conclusion that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is one of the most wicked, vicious, heartless hoaxes ever foisted upon the minds of men. Or, it is the most fantastic fact of history. End quote. Christianity is the only faith, now listen well, especially you young people, because I don't know what you're being taught in school. Christianity is the only faith in the world that claims resurrection for its founder. Now, did you hear me? Abraham would, would be what we would consider the founder of Judaism. Not Christianity, Judaism. Abraham died about 1900 B.C. I've been to his tomb. Guess who's still in the tomb? Abraham's still in the tomb. His body is still there. Uh, Islam. Muhammad died on June the 8th, 632 A.D. He is buried in Medina. Guess where Muhammad still is? If you're a Muslim, you are required to make this trip at least once in your lifetime. Take this trip to Medina to visit the grave of Muhammad. Uh, how about Buddha? Uh, Buddha is, Buddhism is one of those religions, it is kind of an oxymoron. Uh, you don't have to have a god to be a Buddhist. Yeah, it is, it's a godless religion. And um, he, uh, he died in 483 B.C. Never, never, ever one time did any of these major religions claim that their founder rose from the grave. I don't know if they just never thought to come up with that lie. But whatever it was, it, it never happened. And so the resurrection is the single most important fact of our faith. All right? It's not local church, not closed communion. It, it's not those things, even though those are, are, are vital issues. What it is, it is the foundation of Christianity. When Jesus rose from the grave early on Sunday morning, that gave the foundation for Christianity. And uh, he claimed to be, during his relatively short earthly ministry, he claimed to be the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament prophecies, and there are over 300 of them, in the Old Testament concerning himself. He said, in, in one way or another, they're talking about me. That's, that's me. Now, he wasn't bragging. He was just simply stating the fact <clears throat> that this was a reference to my coming into this world. Now, there are three basic credentials that Jesus has that you have got to do something with. If a man is an atheist, he's going to have to do something with this. And most atheists just ignore it. Um, but here are the credentials that his claim as Messiah rests on. Number one, <coughs> his impact on the world. Name me another person that has had the impact that Christ has had on the world. When we cuss, whose name do we use? Buddha, right? Oh, Buddha. Do we say Allah? Yeah, we don't do that. We pick the most powerful name in the known universe because we want to make a very powerful statement. 
And so there's the impact of his life. Look at the, um, look at the hospitals that have been founded. Look at the ministries that have been founded. Look at the songs that have been written. How many songs have you heard about Allah? Allah loves us, this I know, for the Koran tells us, and you know. Did you know not one time does the Quran say that Allah is love? Not one time. Because he's not. You, you don't have a relationship with Allah if you're Muslim. He is your master and you are his slave. Um, and so there's the impact of his, of his life upon history. Number two, there's fulfilled prophecy in his own life. Did anybody here have any prophecy fulfilled in your life? I don't. Not one. Jesus had over 300 very, very specific. Now, if you say, ah, it's coincidental, really? Are you really willing to say that? All 300 of those just happen to find their fulfillment in Christ. If you do believe that, I want to talk to you about some beachfront property in Idaho, okay? It'd be a quick sale. And so that's the second thing, fulfill prophecy in his life. And then the third thing is what we recognize today is the resurrection. And the resurrection and Christianity are tandem truths. Um, if you could disprove the resurrection, you have destroyed Christianity. The resurrection is a tenet of our faith because it is a fact of history. It actually took place. And our faith is built on that. What, what is Christianity? If you could boil it down to one thing, what would you boil Christianity down to? Resurrection. Without the resurrection, nothing else makes any difference. It's just philosophy. And Christianity is not religious philosophy. It's based on an event that took place in history, and we've just read about the, uh, the event. And so here is, here is the, the claim. Three days, approximately 72 hours, after the confirmed death of Christ. All right, he did not pass out. He was dead. These soldiers that were around the bottom of the cross, they weren't just uh, Roman employees. These guys knew how to kill. They recognized death. All right? And Christ had gone into hypovolemic shock. His, 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 his system shut down. He was absolutely, he, he died of asphyxiation. All right? He was uh, he strangled on his own blood and then could no longer breathe. Well, in the tomb where Christ was buried, we think it was in the garden of Gethsemane, uh, just outside the city of Jerusalem. And this tomb that Jesus rose from, this was where he was buried in a body that was numerically the exact same body that was buried. This was not a spiritual resurrection. This was not a philosophical resurrection. This was a bodily, physical resurrection. The same body that went into the grave is a body that came out of the grave. That's why the grave was empty, okay? Now, the resurrection of the Lord was, it, well, it is so easily established. There are so many eyewitnesses. The largest group that we have record of that actually saw Christ after his resurrection was over 500. And I've, I've heard this argument. Well, those people hallucinated. All 500 of them at the same time saw the same thing, all right? psychologists will tell you that it is impossible for that number of people to have the same exact hallucination. That, that just, that would not happen. Now, Dr. Norman Geisler said, quote, if Christ did not rise in the same physical body that was placed in the tomb, then the resurrection loses its value as an evidential proof of his claim to be God. And that's true. If there was no physical resurrection, if people said, oh, yes, he rose from the grave in my mind. No, he didn't rise from the grave in your mind. He rose from the grave physically. The body was empty, okay? The, the uh, tomb was empty. 
And unless Christ rose from the grave physically, his claim to be God can't be verified. Because anybody can say anything. Well, you know, mentally he rose. If his body's still there, what kind of resurrection is that anyway? Is it an emotional resurrection? Is it a, is just a, a resurrection of feelings? It was a physical resurrection. And so nothing else, nothing else recorded specifically in the Gospels serves the same purpose as the pinnacle of our faith, which is the resurrection of Christ. So I want, I want all of us, and I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, I want us to understand that our faith is not simply a religious belief. Our faith is confirmation that Christ rose from the grave. How many of you believe that Abraham Lincoln was shot in Forge Theater in Washington, D.C. by John Wilkes Booth? Were you there? Did you see it? Nobody saw it? Then why is, why is our hand in the air? What evidence do you have that those events took place? Um, I've, I've, I've been in Forge Theater, and I went to, you can't get in the little cubicle where the president was. Uh, they've got it roped off. But I saw the chair he was sitting in. That is not proof, okay? I went across the street to the house where they took him after he was shot in the head. I saw the bed where he was laid. That is not proof, all right? Um, but there were people, there were enough people that saw that, that we have what's called contemporary letters. And <clears throat> probably the most confirmed form of evidence is a contemporary letter. Now, we don't call them contemporary letters. They even call them newspapers, internet. Uh, uh, I've, I've seen the headlines of the newspaper. President Lincoln assassinated. Uh, they've got the gun, the little pistol, little bitty pistol. They've got the instrument that that Navy doctor used to probe in the... That, that's probably what killed him, actually. He was trying to find a bullet. And he bing, bang, bong, 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 bong. And, you know, oh, he died. Uh, and so I've, that, that stuff is there. Now, W.J. Simpson Sparrow said this, quote, If the resurrection is not historic fact, the power of death remains unbroken and with it the effect of sin. And the significance of Christ's death remains uncertified. And accordingly, believers are yet in their sins, precisely where they were before they heard of Jesus' name, end quote. Now, let me touch some nerves here. If salvation is based on the founder's defeat of death, You understand the question? If that's the, the, uh, the fact, can a Jew be saved by believing in Abraham? Can a Muslim be saved by believing in Allah? How about a Buddhist? Why? None of those provide any kind of release from death they're puzzled it's there there is no victory over the ultimate enemy of mankind which is death so if if the founders cannot figure that out what about the followers You've got the same problem see we, we can't figure that out either now jesus predicted his own death so here's what we're going to do. we'll walk through a few verses here this was not an accident. It, this was not, Jesus didn't say, oh, what, whoa, what are y'all doing here? Or what did I do? I hadn't done anything. You know, this was not a surprise. This was all planned before the foundation of the earth was ever laid. That event was planned. Look in the book of Matthew chapter 12. Y'all pardon my voice, by the way. <clears throat> all right, let's jump back to Matthew chapter number 12 and take a look at some of the words of Christ who prophesied his own death. Matthew chapter 12, look at verse uh, 38. Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. Can you show us, show us some kind of evidence that you are who you say you are? But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it 
but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For Jonas is three days and three days in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart, the middle, the center of the earth. Now, that's one. Look at verse, uh, or chapter 16 and verse number 21. Matthew 16, 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show his, unto his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. That is a prophecy of exactly what happened. That, that narrative lays out exactly the order of events that took place. All right, look at chapter 17 and verse number 9. They came down from the mountain, and Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. Another prophecy of his resurrection. Uh, look at chapter 17, verses 22 through 23. And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men. That happened. They shall kill him. That happened. And the third day, Sunday morning, he shall be raised and they were exceeding sorry. Oh, no. Now, if they really understood the concept of what was about to happen, would they have been sorry? No. No, they would not have been. All right, look at uh, chapter 20, verses 18 and 19. Chapter 20, verses 18 and 19. Do what? They really did, yeah. All right, verse 18, uh, Matthew chapter 20. Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man shall be betrayed into the chief priests, under the chief priests and under the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death. So they're going to pronounce the death penalty against him. And shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. Any question that Jesus knew what was about to happen? None. I mean, on and on and on and on we could go about this issue. Um, now, unless Christ was raised from the dead physically, death is still our God. It's the most powerful thing in the universe. That's why Jesus had to die. That's why Christ had to also be raised from the dead. It destroyed the grip of death. You say, well, how did his resurrection impact us 2,000 years later? And that's a great question. Now, Here's what God, the judge of the universe, put in place. My son is going to die in a particular moment of history. And we think that was about 33 A.D. That death would be so legally effective that it could be applied and would be applied to everyone that lived before this event <clears throat> and everyone that would live after this event. In other words, the death of Jesus Christ was so powerfully significant that it can be applied to every sin account in the world of humanity. Now, how, how, how broad is our death? Who would it cover if, if we were to die? Us, that's it, all right? It, it would not cover everybody. And so, um, he said that his being raised from the dead would be a sign. Now, y'all know what a sign is. You see signs on the side of the road that point to something else. All right? You see a Cracker Barrel sign, you don't stop at sign and order lunch. You know, exit 14, 10 miles. That's, it's pointing you to something else. So, this was a sign. What was it a sign of? Tell me. The resurrection was a sign of? Okay, so fulfill prophecy. Right. Okay, that's the major issue right here. I am a son of God. Prove it. Okay, prove it. I will. Destroy this temple in three days. Ah! <laughs> this idiot, you know what he said? He said, you know how long it took us to build that building? 46 years in three days. What, what are you smoking, you know? It, they thought he was nuts. But he spoke of what? 
the temple of his body, which is exactly what happened on the, on the third day. Now, even opponents of Christianity, I find this very interesting. I have read the accounts of a lot of atheists and agnostics. And uh, a, a person that is intellectually uh, functional, which I, I don't think atheists and agnostics really are, but those that are at least a little intellectually honest have to admit and confess, you know, there's something to this. Let me read you something that uh, Adolf Harnack, who was, he rejects a resurrection, okay? So he's not a saved man. Now here's what this guy says. The firm confidence of the disciples in Jesus was rooted in the belief that he did not abide in death but was raised by God. That Christ was risen was in virtue of what they had experienced in him, certainly only after they had seen him. Hmm. Just as sure as the fact of his death and became the main article of their preaching about him. So here's a guy who rejects the resurrection that says, you know, this is what those people believed and here's what they believe, that he rose from the dead. I mean, it was, he didn't spit on this issue. He just, he confesses and admits something changed these guys. Um, in, in 1 Corinthians, we read this this morning, and I'm not going to turn and read this, but in 1 Corinthians 15, that's the resurrection chapter. If the resurrection of Jesus Christ can be proven to be an untrue claim, and, and again, I'm going to do something else next Sunday. I'm not going to come here. This is a waste of my time. But it is a fact of history. And so, and, and you're aware that why do, why do Christians meet on Sunday? That's, that's why. And they, they, by the way, from the first century, we have done this, all right? We, we, every Sunday is a, basically an Easter celebration, every Sunday. And uh, so now... If, if you were to be asked, can you prove, what, what evidence? Now, you Christians believe in the resurrection, correct? Why? Uh, that's what my church teaches. I think that's a really poor answer. That's what my preacher says. That's a poor answer. Why do we believe in the resurrection? And I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to give you seven real quick proofs that you cannot deny and be intellectually honest okay number one the empty tomb explain that to me so well the jews or the romans stole the body might i ask you what would be their motive for removing the very piece of evidence that they needed to discount the ministry of christ if you were going to try to discount the, the resurrection what in the world would you want them to find the body it's not true. Prove it. There he is. He said he'd rise on the third day. This is now day five. <clears throat> there he is. That would, that would destroy the whole thing. And so there is the empty tomb. And there are all kinds of, of uh, explanations, so to speak. Uh, well, you know, the women went to the wrong tomb. Uh, there's the, uh, the swoon theory. And the swoon theory says, well, he lost so much blood and he just passed out on the cross and they took him down and they put him in the cool of the grave and he woke up and slipped out of those grave clothes out of the little face hole right there and he pushed a 20-ton stone out of the way in a weakened state after he'd lost so much. That just makes so much sense, does it not? No, it does not. And so that, that's just one of the ridiculous... Exactly, exactly. And blood and water came out. That uh, we've got a nurse here. You have a, a, a sack around your heart, and it's called pericardium. Okay, pericardium. And when you're under great stress, guess what happens? That sack fills up with fluid, and it constricts your heart. The heart can't beat. And so Christ, under extreme physical duress, now he's got a he's got his pericardium that has filled up with fluid, and the soldier. Pointing up, you know, he hits Jesus under the uh, rib cage right here, and he pierces the pericardium, and guess what came out? Blood and water. So what does that what does that tell us? It means he cut his heart. 
he cut his heart open with the tip of that spear. And uh, plus the fact that these professional executioners did not bash his kneecaps. They didn't break his legs. He was already dead. And so, and they took him down and, and wrapped him and put him in this tomb. And, and one of the interesting things about it, um, the, again, the Jews didn't embalm bodies. Now, the Egyptians did. They'd cut you open. They'd throw everything out. Your heart, your lungs, your liver, your spleen, all that stuff was emptied out, just like we do today. And what they call it, aspiration, uh, they'll stick a tube, uh, like a, I don't know, like a spear with a hole in it, and they will stick that in you and suck all your guts out and fill it up with, I don't know, I don't know what they fill it up with, but that's what they do. They, the Jews didn't do that. They would just wrap you up in all this cloth, and they would put, it was about 100 pounds of spices, uh, because after a while, yeah, it was going to be like when you come by this wastewater treatment plant, you know, you're like, oh, my word. Uh, and so it would take a while for that stuff to deteriorate, and so the women were bringing more spices. Anyway, there's the empty, number two, there's the, Women eyewitnesses. Now, to me, this is a real critical thing, that if you were going to start a rumor of this magnitude, do not use a woman whose word meant nothing. Nothing. And yet, these were the first people that saw the empty tomb, were, were females. And so, ladies, uh, throw your hat in the air that Jesus came, because he elevated your position to be equal with males as you are. I mean, you are equal. All right, then number three, uh, the apostles' newfound courage. Now, right after the crucifixion, where did the apostles and the disciples, where did the disciples go? Why, were, why would they hide? Of? They were next on the hit list. Let's just do away with all of them. They were scared to death that they were going to be executed next. And that's quite possible. Yeah. And it was like, um, you know, so they hid. And no, no proof as of yet. And then the women came. What? Jesus is alive. <laughs> yeah, right. And, and when it became evident, what happened to this bunch of Scared, silly disciples. They came out of their warriors. Now, what would change them? And again, psychiatrists will say, people don't make that sudden a change without reason. What was the reason? Everything that they had been told, everything that Jesus himself had said, apparently, very clearly, was true. And so now, they have the proof, and they go all over Jerusalem preaching, with power, with authority, with confidence. And it's, it, it's interesting to me that for 2,000 years, our bunch, we've been murdered, slaughtered, crucified in any number of ways. We have suffered horrible deaths. You say, well, a lot of cults have experienced that. That's not true. And here, ha here is what has happened. If a cult experiences some kind of persecution for their belief. It is extremely, extremely local. It's like, well, right here, four or five people. What about Christianity? Where have people, worldwide for 2,000 years, we have been slaughtered. Now, uh, here's proof number four. The changed life of James and some others. You know, James was the half-brother of Jesus. When did, when did this guy, now, and I can, I can understand this, um, on a human level, they grew up in the same house, had the same mom. You know, their, their stepdad was Joseph. But how long, do you think James had a hard time believing that his brother really Son of God, the Messiah, really? And he didn't believe that for the longest time. When did he finally come to the realization? Oh, my word. After the resurrection. That's what it took. And so James was so changed, he became the pastor of the church in Jerusalem.
exactly right. What you, we plant seed. We're, we're spiritual farmers. Plant seed. Somebody else will come along, water it. You, don't, you might not even know who that is. You may never know who that is. But the Lord is going to give the increase on that, uh, on that seed. All right, then there is this large crowd <clears throat> of eyewitnesses. They, everyone saw them. So if you've got, let's just make it an even 500. You've got 500 witnesses. How many eyeballs do you have seeing the same thing? you got a thousand eyes seeing the same thing. Here he is. They see him. Now, how do they know that that was the same guy that was put in the tomb? They knew him. They'd seen him before. They saw some scars that were the exact equivalent of crucifixion. The, the, the spike was put through here, not here. Feel the back of your hand. Did not the psalmist say not a bone of him would be broken? Can you get a great big square peg or, or spike through the back of your hand without breaking something? You cannot. But now right here, there's a little... There's a window between the bones, and they would run it through there. And your ankle joints, right, where your, where your ankle, it, there's, again, there's space. And not every victim of crucifixion had his pericardium hit with a spear. He even had, matter of fact, you remember what he told Thomas? Let me see him. Feel, feel the scar in my side. Now, can you explain to me? how scars or um, wounds of that intensity healed in three days. Uh, I've, I've got some cuts and bumps, and, and you do too, on your hands and feet or whatever, and it takes weeks and weeks and weeks. But in three days, this, these, those were healed and left nothing but scars. And so there was there was this large crowd of eyewitnesses and what I'm telling you is this we're not idiots for believing in the resurrection people are idiots for not believing it and, and, I, and I use that word well they're idiots uh, I don't you know these are the kinds of people that do not believe in the face of evidence I just I just don't believe we live in Hardy County okay okay I just don't believe today is Sunday uh, I don't believe two and two is four. I don't believe in the law of gravity. Really. Um, I don't think I'm going to let you co-sign a note for me then if, you know, if that's your mental state. Um, and then number six, there's the conversion of Saul. All right. Now here, here was the Al Capone of his day. This guy was on staff of Sanhedrin. He was their paid assassin. He was their hitman. They would give him a list. All right, on uh, the corner of 4th and Main Street, there's a group that meets down there at that house at uh, 2145 Straight Street. Boom, he would go. He'd break them up. He would take the men. He would execute the men. He would throw the women in jail. This guy was a murderer. This guy was a killer. He hated... Christianity because it contradicted his father faith, which was Judaism. He was, he was a Jew that was screwed down into those traditions and customs as tight as you could get. And then he's on his way to Damascus. To do what, might I ask? Why was he going to Damascus, Syria, several hundred miles north of Jerusalem? He was going up there with papers, exactly. He was going to arrest those folks. So on the way, y'all know the story, light comes down, blinds him, <clears throat> He falls down, and this voice is talking to him, Saul, why, or, yeah, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And, and y'all know the conversation. Uh, the, everybody there saw the light, but he was the only one who heard the voice. And he was blinded for a few days. And he goes on up <clears throat> to Damascus, and this Christian gentleman finds him. Or he find, I'm not sure how that worked out. Takes him into his house, and... I, can you imagine when he found out who he was? And he, he may have known the whole time. We don't know that. But this is your enemy. This is the guy that came up here to kill you. 
And so he takes care of him. And then after a few days, the scales fall off his eyes. And I am convinced that Paul had ophthalmia for the rest of his life. He had really, really bad eyesight. He couldn't see real well at all. And so I think this is the thorn in the flesh that he prayed for. Lord, please remove it. And the Lord said, no. How many times? Three times. And finally, the Lord said, Saul, look, <clears throat> there was Paul at that time. My grace is greater than your eyesight. And Paul accepted it. And as a matter of fact, at the close of one of his letters, he says, you see how I, I wrote with my own hand in such large letters, like a third grader writing, you know, these great big old letters, so they can make sure that they, they make the letters correctly. And uh, so here's, he, he comes back. Here's the word on the street. Saul got saved. Saul's preaching now. And I, what, what do you think the response of the church at Jerusalem would be? Well, what did you just say? Saul got saved. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yep. Saul was the one that had the blood of their family members on his fingertips. He was the guy. They didn't, they didn't like him. They never really, there was not a warm reception for Paul when he came to Jerusalem, and that lasted for the rest of his life. So those, those, were, <clears throat> those were some other scars. Those were some emotional scars that, that Saul put in place. And um, so I can, I can imagine Saul got saved, and, and can you imagine him going to the same synagogues and preaching the gospel? Uh, I can see where there would be some Good night. Now, you explain that to me. Explain how. Did he just change it? Was he going to make more money? Was it going to be happier, healthier days? for? Yeah. And, and so that, that's one of the proofs. And then the last thing is um, multiplied hundreds and hundreds of thousands. But specifically now those in that day died believing this would you die for something you knew wasn't true how many Christians do you think would die believing something that is true I mean today for instance in North America how many of us do you think would die for their Christian faith there's no way to know that I think yeah, I think one day, yeah, one day that's probably going to be something that's going to be seen. Uh, but these people, I have read stories. I've got uh, several books at the House, Churches in the Valleys of the Piedmont, uh, and did all kind of accounts of people that died in the most horrendous of ways. I've read stories about uh, women who were pregnant. These men would cut the baby out in front of the husband. They made him watch baby would fall out on the ground and it just they were they were tied in animal skins bloody animal skins and wild animals uh, wolves and, and wild dogs would eat their bodies uh, taken into uh, the uh, theater there in Rome killed by lions uh, could you imagine enjoying being entertained by that I can't I can't comprehend that level of hatred of women children and, and men, oh, y'all, we're going to go to the, see the Lions play today <coughs> and go to the Coliseum. Yes, they did. And take your family to see people getting torn apart by Lions. Um, that, that is a level of satanic hatred that I cannot even comprehend. But um, tell me another faith that has experienced that, please. Can you think of any group of people in the world that have experienced and suffered what we have experienced and suffered as a, as a group of people? They don't exist. It does not exist. And so specifically, you young people, uh, again, I don't know what y'all, if you're in public schools especially, I don't know how this is approached, if it's even ever mentioned. But I want you to be very much aware that what we believe and what you believe as a Christian is historically verifiable proof. It is evidence. 
and don't ever stop believing it. Uh, I'm just, I can't stop believing that the sun warms the earth. Well, what, what proof do you have of that? Because I'm, I'm warm. <laughs> First of all, I'm warm. And so we have so, so much evidence. Uh, and I'm glad that the Lord has left his footprint in the historical record of humanity. It is so, so easy to follow. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful that we have that kind of a God. Anybody have any, anything? That, yes, ma'am. Okay. Great question. It's a great question. Um, the same way we get saved, only with this different perspective. People that <clears throat> people that lived before Christ, Jews in the Old Testament, for instance, they believed by looking forward to the Messiah. We believe by looking backward. We believe in the same exact Messiah. They did. There were many, many Jews who believed in the suffering, the death, and the burial of their Messiah. They believed it was going to happen. That's what saved them. Because it hadn't happened yet. It, right. That was going to happen. But it's the same, we believe the same thing, just from different ends of the AC. Of, yes. Right. Right. Yep, good question. Good question. And, Correct. Right now, they're in heaven if they believed. Before Christ rose, before the resurrection, there was a place in the inner part of the earth called paradise or Abraham's bosom. And there was a chasm between these two places. You've got Hades and you've got Abraham's bosom. And there was this gap between the two. And if you remember the rich man and Lazarus, they had the conversation. Send him, that guy right there, send him. You know, he can just touch his finger and water. And t um, that place was emptied out when Christ rose from the grave. And those, those pre-resurrection souls are now in heaven. They weren't. That was the Old Testament place of rest and reward, basically, for the Old Testament saints. That place is empty now. And he took those folks to heaven uh, at his resurrection. Good questions. Good questions. Right, anybody else? Yes, sir. Every, every belief, whether you're an atheist, agnostic, whatever, whatever it is, it is a religious belief. The evolutionist, that's a religion. He believes. Did you see it? No. You have any evidence? No. That's called faith, you know, when, when you have not seen anything yet you believe it. Now, we as Christians live in a world of evidence. We live in the courtroom full of evidence that God did exactly what Genesis said he did. There is no evidence. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist 
or an evolutionist. I just, I don't see that. I can't, no, <laughs> no, I, I can't. Now, but here's the thing. Also, um, we live in a day when a man thinks he's a woman. What evidence do you have of that? Well, it's just what I think. Okay. That's all. That's it. That's what you got. You think that? Um, yeah, that's delusional, man. That's just, that's, uh, that's brain damage right there. what that is. All right. Pardon? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. Yep. But, it, and, and you know, you would, and I've often thought about this. How powerful do you think it might be if the Lord let out of hell 10 significant atheists that lived during their particular generation? What if he just let them out to get back on the earth, put them on TV, put them on the radio, you know, how, how I don't know, effective would that be? But that, that all was offered to the Lord and said, no, no, said, we're not going to do that. If they will not believe Moses and the prophets, neither would they believe if one rose from the dead. And I'm like, you're right i'm afraid you're right thank you all for being here i appreciate it hope you all have a wonderful monday tuesday wednesday see you wednesday night lord willing and uh then ladies you got your you got the ladies tree coming up this weekend and uh hope you go enjoy that all right let's bow for prayer father we bow tonight thank you for the proof and the evidence it is so obvious uh, scripture says a fool has said in his heart there is no god it's the, it's the mindless one, the thoughtless one, the one that has no intelligence. It says, no, there's no God. But those who have been given wisdom believe thoroughly in you, and we do. We believe that the resurrection was a fact of human history. It did take place. Not only did it take place, we believe in the purpose for it taking place. You took our sin to the cross. You rose to defeat death on our behalf. Thank you for that. I pray that you bless us now as we walk in our world this week. May people be challenged and changed as a result of their contact with us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.